So we are very pleased to have uh, Sagib Schiffman here today. So Sagib is he's a senior lecturer in our Department of Genetics, and he had he received his PhD from uh, from here from Hebrew U, training in the laboratory of Ariel Davasi, where he was studying the genetics basis of schizophrenia. He then did his postdoc studies at the Wellcome Trust Center for Human Genetics in Oxford with Jonathan Flint, studying the genetic basis of anxiety and depression. And his current research focuses in the genetics of autism. And in 2013, he was awarded the prestigious Kill Prize for the World Foundation for Excellence in, Sci uh, in Scientific Research. So, congratulations. Okay, thank you very much. It was a long flight, so <laughs> I'm still jet lagged. Um, so, uh, as you see, the topic autism, a complex uh, biological story, um, this is, uh, I think, the, one of the main messages of, of this talk that autism. Um, some people don't like that I say it's complex because this means that maybe we cannot understand it, like some people say on the brain. But what you're going to see, I think, in, in my talk, that autism is not just one entity. It's not just one disorder. It's a collection of, of I would say, different disorders. And we still don't understand most of it, but our knowledge is... Um, increasing with time, and we know much more than what we knew just a few years ago. So autism, um, so this is the outline of the talk. I'm going to have a short introduction uh, on autism. I will talk about neuropathological findings in autism. Then I will focus on genetic architecture of autism, and I hope to finish if I have time, with the role of chromatin regulators in autism. So autism spectrum disorders is a spectrum of disorders. Some people, instead of saying autism spectrum disorder, they call it disorders, or instead of autism, autisms. As I said, it's a collection of, of entities, and it's currently defined only by uh, behavioral abnormalities. So there is no lab test that you can do um, to uh, diagnose autism. So it's only based on observation of behavior. And what you see here in this picture is a child that every day before he goes to sleep, he will sort all of his toys in this particular way. And this is a type of behavior, a repetitive behavior that is typical to uh, children with autism. Autism is characterized by impaired social development, uh, communication defects, and repetitive behavior. So the uh, impaired social development includes uh, problems in communicating or interacting with uh, peers, with, with children the same age. Um, communication defects includes a problem with, with language, language delay, absence of language, um, but there is a lot of variability. So some kids might have uh, no language at all. Some might have uh, even sophisticated language. And repetitive behavior uh, includes also restrictive uh, interest uh, or rituals like um, the, the behavior that you see here. So from, from the phenotypic uh, point of view, there is a large variability between kids. So each kid is almost has his own um, phenotype. The other thing which is important is the what we call the age of onset, or the age that you could uh, diagnose autism uh, in a... In a uh, could be sure about the diagnosis is around the age of three. Although, in many cases, you don't hear? Okay. Um, although, in many cases, do you hear? Is it better? Okay. Although, 
I think it's okay, the buttering. Uh, although in many, many cases, I can scream also. Um, although in many cases you see problems uh, very early on. Okay? The other thing which we, you should know about autism is it includes, um, as you can see, it's a great modern health concern. It includes, was including autist, the classic autistic disorder, Asperger's syndrome, and perversive developmental disorder, or PDD, which is the more, um, I would say, um, th this is the kids that do not meet the full criteria of autism. And it is a great modern health concern because currently it is estimated that around 1% of the children, especially in the U.S., um, meet the, uh, the criteria for autism spectrum disorder. And the, uh, another very important thing to know is that there are much more boys than girls, as you can see here, um, which is something which is typical to other neurodevelopmental problems. Uh, and there is also a, an increase in prevalence of autism with, with, uh, with years. And, and you can see it in the following graph that they took from Autism Speaks. So in x-axis, this is the years. And the y-axis, it's uh, the prevalence, and you can see that it uh, um, that it goes from one in five thousand in, in 1975 to one in 110 in 2009, and it's still increasing with time. How, how much of that curves because of changes in definitions? Okay. So, so of course uh, it depends who you ask. What, what are the reasons for this increase? But it's definitely part of it is because the definitions are broader uh, for both sides and also because of awareness, okay? Which is very, very important. This is all the spectrum. Yes, this includes the whole spectrum, so the entire spectrum. The it's true that some of the more, um, I would say, uh, Cases which were um, not uh, classical auti uh, autism were not maybe were not diagnosed before. Uh, some people claim that this is all because of diagnosis and awareness. Some people say that there is also an effect of the environment. So it really depends who you ask. Okay. Is this the same all over the world? Uh, roughly, yes. Okay. Not exactly in the same numbers. For example, here in Israel the estimation of the current prevalence is around 1 in 150. So it, it depends, but there is a rise in, in, in the frequency in all, in, in, in all the countries that people are studying, which is the Western world. Non-Western world, we don't really know what's going on. Forgive me, this now, this, this graph makes him and now me very worried because in 50 years everybody will be obese. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. So this is the problem with theoretical um, biolo or biology or theoretical <laughs> arguments. Because what they do, they just fit a curve and <laughs> without taking into account other things. So you could think that it will, you know, in, in a few years, it will set on, on a, some number. We don't know. Uh, I didn't bring the, really the, the figures actually didn't bring the, the graph that might make some of you really worried. I don't have them here. The ones which correlate the paternal age with autism. So I took that, them out because of, there are many young students here. I don't want to <laughs> push you to um, have kids. Okay. So this is just, I want to show you a short story history of the autism research. And what, I, what, I, what I'm going to show here are just kind of landmarks. Most of, most of, the, of those landmarks are genetic landmarks. Okay, so first of all, before 1943, there was no autism in the world. Okay, it was zero because it was just um, first um, <coughs> termed by Leo Canel in 1943. What he did was to describe a dozen of kids I think it was 11, not a dozen, uh, but 
with the same kind of characteristics of classical autism as we, we know today. Um, then in, only in 1977, there was the first study that showed uh, a strong genetic basis for autism. Then in another landmark study is in 2003, the, the connection between neuro, neuroligins uh, with autism. These are um, proteins which are very important for the function of the, of the synapse. <coughs> And then in 2007, there were studies showing the de novo copy number variations. These are um, deletions and duplications which are new, not inherited, which are, um, and as you can see, you're going to see soon, are more common in patients, individuals with autism. And in 2003, there are a couple of studies showing that de novo mutations, single base mutations uh, in hundreds of genes, uh, may cause autism, okay? So what you see here though in this circle, um, the black line is what we know, okay? So it's increasing with time. And I, I, I would say that the gray area is the remaining question. So we don't know much, but just because we know what kind of question to ask now. I think so. this is the two things that are increasing all the time, our knowledge and the questions. In addition to what we know, there are things that we knew, but were just wrong. For example, um, the theory about cold mothers, that autism is caused mainly by the mother's uh, neglect. Of course, fathers are not important. They don't need to care about the kids <laughs> at all. But um, this was a theory that I would say um, is probably wrong. Okay? I'm not saying that you cannot see some behavioral um, abnormalities in the, in the parents. Sometimes you do see that they have social uh, problems. Maybe they don't meet autism and they have social problems, but it doesn't mean that this is causing autism. It might mean that they're transmitting some genetic elements. Okay? Yes, it could be caused by the autistic child because of stress. Okay, I agree with this comment. Yeah. Can I ask what will talk about I will talk about it uh, later, much more. But so. so what leads to autism? So I know where I am. So that's why I started with saying that the brain functions differently, of course, in, in autistic children. And, and this probably leads to autism, yeah? But I've drawn here a double arrow uh, uh, to say that not just that the brain, because it functions differently, it causes autism. Autism also changes the brain because our behavior also changes the way our, our brain is. I hope both, all of you agree with this. So what causes the brain to function differently? So, of course, the environment. Also, again, here, our brain uh, um, environment changes our brain, and our brain changes our environment. For example, of course, the environment of an autistic child is not the same environment as a normal child, yeah? because he will choose specific foods even, or he will play in a different way, etc., etc. Okay, so he will have a different environment. And then, of course, there is the genetics, the, the variation in the DNA, here I, I wrote it in one way on, only because, as far as I know, the way the bre it's not so true. It's just the paper published in Nature yeah, yeah, I know. What I'm talking about are not somatic mutations. I'm talking about um, uh, variations, um, those inherited uh, muta uh, variations that we have in our DNA sequences. I'm not talking about changes in the cells, which are. Um, as Ami was trying to say, um, our changes later on that we don't really currently don't really study. Okay, so I'm talking about the variation that we are born with. Okay, and of course there is interaction between the genetics and the environment. What about expression? Is it expression? They are 
yes, this is here. This is somewhere here, okay, between the, the, the variation and, and the brain function. But the way the brain function may change the... The gene expression, this is true. That's why I'm trying to say, what I'm trying to say is that maybe we should go this way and understand from here to here, just because the direction here is more clear, what is causative and what is not. Here we're going to see a lot of correlation between all kinds of things, and it's very hard to say what's causing autism or what, what is caused by autism. Okay? I'm trying just to defend the fact that I'm doing a lot of genetics. Okay? <laughs> so we know that uh, autism has a very genetic basis because of, mainly because of twin studies. And <coughs> in twin studies, what we do is we compare the concordance rate between monozygotic and uh, di dizygotic twins, meaning between identical twins, 100%, and non-identical twins that share only 50% of the genetic variation. And what we, what we expect is that if a trait is uh, highly irritable, uh, we're going to see a big difference between the monozygotic and the dizygotic twins. Okay? And this is what you see here. So for autism, spectrum disorders, so this is not for classical autism, it's for autism, spectrum disorders, the uh, concordance rate for identical twins is, this is the upper limit actually, it's between 60 to 90 percent, depends on the study. And for non-identical twins, it could be between zero and 30 percent. Okay. Still, though, in all studies, you see a big difference between the identical twins and non-identical twins, which is the way in humans to show that the trait is is um, uh, heritable. Siblings has a much higher risk of autism. Is if one, um, sorry, yes, um, so yeah, they're in, in kind of the same risk, but they are in a higher higher risk than than just uh, <coughs> the other um, evidence for genetic uh, contribution. Um, to autism is the, that many syndromes, um, which we know the genetic basis of those syndromes in most cases, are also associated with, with autism. So this is a table that shows you many syndromes associated with autism. So for example, Fragile X syndrome, which you all know, caused by mutations in fmr one gene, in around 25% of males and 6% of females will meet the diagnosis of autism, spectrum disorders, okay? And this will account for around 1% to 2% of cases. So if I take just a random sample of autistic cases, around 1% to 2% of them will have mutations in the fmr one gene, okay? So this is also true uh, for other genes here, for other syndromes. You probably all know Red syndrome, caused by mutation in the MACP2 gene. Here, all the individuals will meet the criteria for autism spectrum disorders. Most of them will be girls. And this um, uh, accounts for around 0.5% uh, of cases. If you look at the, the entire table, each one of those syndromes will account for m a maximum of 1%. Okay? So, so the so Uh, why do we see it more in males? Yeah. Uh, why does it make sense? I don't know. No, but um, you w we we're going to... Uh, did I include it? No. We're not going to talk about it too much. But there are a lot of differences between males and females in autism from the genetic perspective. And we, we can talk about it, if you like, later. Um, so you can see that for most cases, this is, uh, accounts for a lo low percentage of, of cases. So it means that, and I didn't talk about, so this is old, old news, I would say. This is old, old syndromes 
Uh, most of them we knew for many times that are associated with autism. Some of the new syndromes like the 20Q deletion in mutation in chunk 3 gene, which is again responsible for a protein that function at, at the synapse. Um, these are syndromes that are new, kind of new syndromes that were identified based on the genetics. Okay? So they are now a syndrome just because people found that particular people have mutations in this gene. But what I'm trying to say is that if you're going to take now a, um, just, let's say, 10 or 20 individuals with, or, or with <coughs> autism, yeah? When I say autism here, I, I mean autism spectrum disorder across the whole talk, okay? So if you take 10 people, you are taking 10 people with different etiologies, okay? And so if we look at, for example, neuropathological findings, if we look at syndromic autism, you can see very clear uh, uh, findings. For example, in fragile X, you, would, you, you will see accelerated early head growth, you will see abnormalities in volume of different uh, uh, regions of, 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 of the brain. And you're going to see changes in the, uh, in the dritic spine maturation. All this is something that you will see in fragile X, in the brain of fragile X syndrome. In red syndrome, for example, you're going to see global hypoplasia of the brain and progressive cerebral atrophy, um, reduced dendritic, dendritic arborization of uh, pyramidal neurons, etc., etc. However, if we look at what we call idiopathic cases, cases which we don't know the cause of autism, we don't see a very consistent findings. Again, just, this is just because they have different etiologies. So you take a group of individuals, each one has probably a different cause. So it's a, actually a a group of disorders, okay? There are still some things that we do see. So, so based on the symptoms, it's, it's hard to... So, yeah, in theory, ideally, you would have some kind of phenotype that you can divide the individuals and have a more homogeneous group it's very hard to achieve this. Okay. I've got a problem. I have a, an expert of autism here. Um, so one of the findings that we do see is uh, br that the brain growth is altered in around 10 to 20 percent of individuals with AFD. Uh, there are reports of uh, smaller corpus callosum, uh, defects in neurogenesis, abnormal neuronal migration, but this is not something you're going to see in all individuals, in some individuals. Loss of, of Purkinje cell, I don't know if Yossi Arom is here, this is, was just for him, and, and others. But the most consistent thing is the, the changes in brain, brain growth. And you can see it here, this is a meta-analysis that was published in 2007 in Neuron. Each dot is a different study, and in general, what you see, which is also illustrated here, is that kids with, with on the spectrum are born in, in, with relatively small brain, which increases in the first few years. And then there is an arrest of this growth, and in, uh, in, in uh, older age, it's the same kind of size of, of a normal uh, child. Okay? So, Macrocephaly or large brain are now being used as a um, indicator of a problem of uh, gone? Uh, so this is an indication of of autism. <coughs> <coughs> Again, this is around in, in you, this is something we see, see in around 10 to 20 percent of cases. Okay. I should maybe say that with the new genetics that we have now, in some cases we see that when you have a mutation in a particular gene, 
uh, so some of them, I would say it in a different way. We know now that particular mutations may be, in, in particular genes, may be associated with this uh, uh, brain growth. So we could start with the genetics, say, this is a group of individuals, which is, this is the, the phenomenon. Okay. So it's not just that the, the brain pathology is very complex, it's also the genetics, as, as you saw already in the table, uh, that there are many syndromes associated with autism. Autism is influenced by, first of all, by many different types of, of genetic variants. Um, there are, we have uh, evidence for the involvement of common variation, I mean genetic variations that we all have, um, rare variation, so these are inherited variation that may be may, uh, particular <coughs> to, uh, or specific to a particular family, uh, and also what we call the novel mutations. These are new, the new mutation, okay? So it's not inherited, but this is our mutation um, that, um, that we have in sperm or in the egg. It's also very complex because there are hundreds of genes that we know, or we estimate that there are hundreds of genes that may cause autism when disrupted. Another problem in, in the field is that mutations in each one of the genes that we identified until now can give rise to many different uh, neurodevelopmental problems. So I don't, I don't know of any gene that is specific to autism. So we find it, let's say we find a mutation in a specific gene, we see that it's in, uh, enriched in, in individuals with autism. Um, eventually, we will find the same kind of mutations in some cases of maybe mental retardation or uh, epilepsy, schizophrenia, etc. So I don't know of any gene currently that is specific to, that is, when it's disrupted, it causes only autism. Okay? Sorry? Yeah, but of course, red syndrome includes a lot of things. It includes also mental retardation, uh, sometimes epilepsy, etc. So they have, many of the autistic uh, kids, of, of course, have what we call comorbidities. They have uh, around 30% or 20% will have epilepsy. Almost 50% will have also a low IQ. But in addition, we see those mutations in individuals which has only... Um, <coughs> Uh, mental retardation, or only schizophrenia, etc. So, um, one of the convergence in the field until now was uh, about synaptic dysfunction in ASD, because many of the genes that were identified are involved in, in the synapse. Uh, this is just a figure from a review in cell showing many of the genes uh, and their function at the synapse, some of them have a general synaptic function. Some of the genes have a f uh, function in, in, uh, in translational regulation at the postsynaptic uh, uh, region, like uh, the fmr one gene. Uh, uh, many of the genes were found to have um, to be influenced by neuronal activity. Many of the genes here that you see here are uh, neuronal saladation molecules um, uh, that function at, at the synapse. But uh, as you all know, the synapses are you know, everywhere. It's a very general thing. And uh, the big question is why this is causes autism and not something else. Uh, some theories about brain dysfunction <coughs> from, this is mainly comes from, from human studies and also from uh, mouse models is, first of all, one theory talks about the imbalance between excitation and inhibition, which is also, again, a very general thing. Uh, some people claim it's all the, about the microcircuit dysfunction, or other people will say it's, the, it's all about the long-distance connectivity. But, as I said until now, I mean, autism is not one thing, so we don't need one theory to explain all of it. Still, um, um, people are looking for convergence. Okay. So now I want to start talking about the genetic architecture. How much time I have? Ah. 
not a lot. Um, so about the genetic architecture. So there is also a, a lot of um, arguments and uh, discussion about what type of genetic variations are more important in autism. Whether this is our common variation or rare variation. So the rare variation is like a stick, a big stick that you break the camel back. It's one strong effect. Or it could be common variation ver with very, very small effects. So each one doesn't really influence maybe a little bit the risk of autism. But the accumulation of more and more of those alleles uh, breaks the camel. Okay. So you can also look at it like that. So each error here, the size of the error is the, the size of the effect. It could be strong effect or a lot of small effect. The problem is that until now, common variations were not robustly identified using genome-wide association studies. Um, in autism, until now, there were, there were a few of those studies, mostly with quite lo uh, low, uh, uh, small uh, sample size, so they were not very powerful. Still, we don't have evidence, good evidence, for any specific common variation. This is just one example from Nature. They identified one single nucleotide variation in this region here that was associated significantly with autism. I'm just going to explain very briefly that uh, about this plot. If you didn't see it before, uh, people also call it Manhattan plot, just because they want these big things going up. This is a, sometimes a, doesn't work, and you get mo something more that looks like Brooklyn. But the in the y-axis, this is the minus log base 10 of the p-value. So if you see here 7, it means that the p-value was 10 to the minus 7, etc., etc. So this is the most significant uh, peak, okay? That's why you want a Manhattan plot, a lot of peaks coming up. This is just a zoom in showing the area of uh, significance. Uh, it's an area very far from any gene. And... So this was a nature paper. The problem is that a few months after this paper, so they eventually identified an association with autism, uh, with the common variation, other pub, uh, studies after this study uh, couldn't replicate the results. So still, we don't have any single SNP that we can say it's definitely uh, associated with autism. Uh, most of those genome wide association studies are in this actually in kind of the same population. Most of the studies are, in, again, in the Western world, you're using European people with uh, European ancestry in most cases. For rare variation, it's different. Um, we know that rare variation ca can cause autism, as you saw already with the syndromes associated with autism. The other thing we, we, that uh, people found is that which was very um, maybe surprising is that de novo mutations have a very large effect in autism. So here in this study in, in 2007, what they showed it is that if you compare control uh, to families with autism, simplex families or multiplex families, simplex is families with one child with autism, multiplex families are um, with multiple children with autism, there, in both cases you see increase in uh, in the number of uh, de novo copy number variations. Again, this is deletions or duplications of lower regions, which includes a lot of genes inside. Okay. So we can say that the focus in the field sh shifted towards rare variation. This is a cover of Neuron from, uh, I think, 2011. They had a large study of, again, of de novo copy number variation, in which I, they identified uh, many of those. And, but this doesn't make it much simpler because in almost in each individual, you see a different type of mutation, a different type of deletion or duplication. So here I plotted for you the list of all the genes under those de novo copy number variations. So, so we have this list. What do we do with it? So this is one of the problem, okay? problems that we need to deal with. So there are a lot of genes. These are large regions. 
and we don't know which one is really causing autism and which one is just near a gene causing autism. Uh, we are trying. We just need uh, some billions of dollars uh, and the samples, of course. Uh, no, because it's deletions that will be near near each other. So, one of the main goals in in, in my lab is to identify chair mechanisms leading to uh, ASD, to autism spectrum disorder, despite the fact that it involves many distinct genetic insults. Okay, and. And in the, so I had a very long introduction, um, too long maybe. So what I'm going to tell you uh, briefly is the way we do it. So we've got different approaches. One, I would call it two, two kind of approaches. One is what I call a system to genes or a top-down approach, which is mainly based on uh, looking at genetic variation and it, uh, looking at uh, human brain samples for autistic and controls. And the other approach, which is genes to system, this is looking at models, mainly until now cellular models, but now we're trying, trying to produce mass models, and this is focusing on particular genes. Okay? So I want to give you just a, kind of a brief taste of, of the first and the second uh, approaches. So this is a, a work that was done mainly by Eyal Ben David. He doesn't like the picture. I should have changed it. I'm sorry. Um, the, the title of the, talk, of the paper was Networks of Neuronal Genes Affected by Common Rare Variation in Autism Spectrum Disorders. And the recent question was, first of all, do common variation collectively increase the risk of, of ASD? So you saw already that for one particular SNP, we cannot really say that it's associated with, with autism, but maybe by looking at a collective of, of those SNPs together, we can say something. The other uh, uh, question was, what kind of genes are involved, what are affected? And the other question, which was the most, uh, maybe the more, more important one, was whether rare and common variation converge on the same type of, of genes, or they actually affect very different genes, assuming that there is an effect of the common variations. Okay? So I'm not going to get into details exactly how we did it, also because we don't have a lot of time, but the, the rationale was to take all the genes in the genome and divide them into related groups, functionally related groups. And this is not something which is easy to do. You cannot just download and, ha and know exactly what the function, because many of the genes, we don't know their functions at all, and, and it's hard to say which one are related to which. Um, so I'm going to tell you exa exactly how we did it. Maybe not the best way, but this is one of the ways you can do it. Then we tested the enrichment of rare and common variation in each one of those groups, and looked to see if the same groups are affected, groups of genes are affected by both common and rare variation. So the way we did it, we used um, a network uh, analysis called Weighted Gene Co-Expression Network Analysis. Uh, if, so we are looking at gene expression data from human brain, the entire human brain, almost 1,000 different regions of the human brain. And we are assuming that, and we are looking at the patterns of expression of all the genes in the genome, and we are assuming that if two genes are related, functionally related, they will show the same kind of pattern. Okay? So it will be expressed in similar levels, or will have correlation uh, across different regions of the brain. Okay? This is the assumption. So if every region was uh, extracted, this was not done by us. This was done by the Allen Brain uh, Institute. So what they did was to take each of those regions and extract RNA and get the profile of the gene expression. Now you understand how we did it. Okay. So this is healthy, healthy individuals, and it, and I also need to say it's an adult brain, okay? Adults. Adult brain, which is maybe not the best for this study, but this is what we did. The this is control, normal adult brain. So we are not caring about here about the status, whether it's a 
autistic or not. We are just looking at the relationship between genes based on gene expression. And how okay? long after death will the tissue available? Okay, so this is always a problem with humans. Especially the, uh, the, the alternative is to go to China and use, you know, fresh humans or, <laughs> or to work on mice. But if you want to work in, in humans, this is what you do. Uh, they do it as fast as they can. I mean, the, they check. Yes, exactly. They do it as soon as possible, and they and they know that the RNA. That they look at the RNA and they see that the RNA is good. Of course, to get those samples, you collect a lot of brain samples. Most of them are not good because the RNA is degraded, and you just skip the ones which are good. But this is, you know, not the main focus. So, and I'm not going into the details again, exactly how we, 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 we connected the genes. But in, in, in the end, what we get is our groups of genes. And just to visualize those groups, we give them names as colors. Okay? So each color here in this bar is a group of genes. And, and there are big groups, small groups. And then you can characterize these groups. And in most cases, they, um, they correspond to specific cell type or specific, um, uh, very general um, mechanisms. For example, this magenta is actually correspond to astrocytes. How do we know it? It's because if we look at the genes in this astrocyte we, we, uh, and we look at genes which we know are specifically expressed in astrocytes, um, uh, we see an a, a a increase in the relative risk of the enrichment of astrocyte genes in this module. So, so this is what I would call kind of uh, in silico dissection. So we kind of, we actually see the patterns of, 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 of the different distribution of cells in the brain in many cases. This affects the gene expression. The, this is the, the strongest effect. And for example, the yellow module correspond to, actually, we've got two separate subnetworks. One of them uh, is microglia, mainly genes that are specific to microglia. So we can use this module to look at the, the distribution of microglia in the brain. Okay? And then we, we have, there is another subnetwork which is enriched for ribosomal proteins, a translation module. I don't know why they are connected, the microglia with the translation, maybe because microglia uh, are activated after death. I don't know. Okay. So then what we wanted to know is whether those modules are enriched. So we, we tested the enrichment of both common variation in each one of those groups. Okay. We used the list of 109 genes with mutations in autism. I must say that this list is problematic because it was a biased list because it was a list from many different studies they didn't look at the whole ge uh, genome, but once some people found uh, mutations in synaptic genes, other people were looking for mutations in other synaptic genes, for example. Okay, so this is an, an biased list. Then we looked at also on common variation. This is a result of a genome-wide association uh, that was performed on multiplex families, and we had a replication of two other sets of common variations. Doesn't matter, one of them is a mixture of simplex and multiplex. One, the other one is simplex families. And maybe I need to skip this QQ plot. This is just showing that this is the expected p-values distribution. This is the observed p-values distribution. And you can see for this case, there is no difference between what you expect and what you observe, meaning you've got nothing. Okay? For a single SNP, you don't have anything. In this case here, you do see some enrichment. So there is some kind of association here. This is just what it means. It doesn't matter so much. But um, so what we found is here what you see is in red, this is a signal of enrichment. So if it's red, this is mean that this module was enriched with rare variation or uh, common variations. This is from one sample. And you can also plot the enrichment in, of rare variation against the, or the common variation against the rare variations. And you can see that there is a general trend of correlation between them. So each one of those dots is a different module. Same if we include also the other genome-wide association studies. 
So in general, we have uh, two modules which are significantly enriched with common and rare variations. And just to make it short, it's not very surprising that these two modules are also uh, um, neuronal, are enriched with neuronal, neuronal genes. Okay? There's another one which is enriched with neuronal genes, this gray one, which is actually um, represents uh, interneurons, but they are not significantly enriched, okay, with common or rare variation. We can also look at the distribution in the brain of those modules, and the light green module, one of them, and this is just the genes which are the most connected ones, and those are all synaptic genes, and the highest expression you see in, in sensory uh, regions like the somatosensory regions and uh, the visual cortex. The other module, uh, the most connected genes are actually transcription factors, um, and the highest expression is in the dentite gyrus and the, and the dorsal striatum. Again, as you all know, it's regions of, of adult neurogenesis, and because we're looking at uh, adult brain, it could mean that we're actually, the same genes are also involved in, in the development of the brain, okay? So this could be like uh, uh, a part of the brain that uh, uh, copies the, the processes and the genes that are involved also in the development. So this is one of the problems of the study is that we looked at adult brain. Um, we also did a study looking at a more unbiased uh, list of genes. This is a list of genes coming from exome sequencing. So this is our very new studies um, that sequence in, in hundreds of individuals with autism they, the entire regions of the genome that codes for proteins. Okay? So this list is unbiased. We've been looking at the whole genome okay, for mutations. So we, ha we had, um, from those four studies, we took all the data. It includes 965 cases with autism. Uh, we, in those 965 cases, there were 121 genes with de novo mutations that disrupt the gene, disrupt the protein, or most likely disrupt the protein. And if you look at those genes, you do see something else than previously was reported. Um, so as I said, most of the studies until now were concentrated on, on synaptic genes. What you're going to see uh, now is that w most of those de novo mutations in this unbiased screen are actually in, in transcription regulators, uh, uh, which are expressed during development and not in the adult brain. So what we did was to take all of those genes and actually to divide them into two, two groups. There is also one group which is um, others, I would call it. So what you see here is the two groups, and they div are divided by the general pattern of expression. If you take all the genes in the genome, most of them will divide in these two, two, into all the genes which are expressed in the brain. Most of them will be divided into to these two groups. One group are the, um, the blue uh, dots, are genes that are expressed high uh, before birth. So zero here is birth. After zero, this is in years. Before zero, this is in weeks. So many of the, so most of the genes, you can divide them into genes or that are expressed before birth or that are expressed after birth. So you have this kind of uh, distinction between the, the uh, uh, two groups of genes. There are genes that are expressed all uh, quite stable, but they are not included here, okay? But this is, on, on itself, was amazing to see that you have a very, very sharp um, di di uh, uh, division between genes which are expressed before birth and genes which are expressed after birth. And if we look at all the genes with de novo disruptive mutation, we see that they are enriched for the, in the group which of genes that are expressed in, in the uh, brain before birth. And the way we do it, we compare um, 
disruptive mutations, the novel disruptive mutations with um, silent mutations. So silent mutations are mutations that don't disrupt the protein. So this is our, our control. And so we look at the distribution of the silent mutation. You can see that most of them are what I call here others. So they are not in the uh, developmental group. Okay? So they are expressed or during adulthood or they are expressed in the same level uh, in different developmental stages. However, if we look at the disruptive mutation, you see an enrichment for the developmental uh, genes. So the, there is here an enrichment for genes which are expressed before birth. The other thing is that if you look at uh, the type of genes, there is a very strong enrichment for genes which are expressed in the nuclei, uh, for chromatin regulators, uh, transcription regulation, and chromatin modification. So the bottom line of, of, of this study is that although until now most of the studies were focused on, on synaptic genes, um, if we look at unbiased screen of, of mutations in autism, the, a, a big majority of them are expressed during development and are chromatin regulators or transcription factors. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So I didn't tell you all the controls we did. So one control is compared to within the same individuals comparing the disruptive to the silent mutation. This is one control. The other control we did was cases versus control. So this is also highly enriched. The mutation is disruptive. The novel mutations are highly enriched in chromatin regulators. Also, if you compare them to just normal control, exome sequencing from normal control. And the other thing, the third control is the siblings. Okay, the unaffected siblings of those individuals, again, you see the same thing. I didn't go into all the details. Now, because I don't have a lot of time, I just wanted to show you the other approach, which I don't think I have time, really, no? I need to finish now. People also look very tired. Uh, um, so I can just, you know, do it very fast like this. Uh, <laughs> what I want to show you here was that, never mind, Oops. Um, before the summary, okay, I can tell you what I, I was showing you very fast. It was just one study on one particular gene, okay, that we found to be disruptive in autism. And it was a gene that we didn't know what's the function of this gene. And we found that this gene is involved, again, in chromatin regulation during brain development. Um, and if you mutate this gene in, in cellular model, um, you get um, abnormal expression of all kinds of genes that shouldn't ex be expressed um, in the forebrain. Um, this results in cell death, also in the patients and in, in the dish. Um, and this is just, again, a, another approach going from the gene towards the other genes that are regulated by this gene and showing very similar findings against the importance of uh, chromatin regulators uh, and, and transcription factors in, in autism. So this is actually the summary of what I just said, that both kind of approaches show the same um, uh, importance of this uh, chromatin regulators. So I think I will just finish with acknowledging uh, people who did the work. I didn't show you the work of Galia and Loa. This was the one I've, I've, I've just uh, skipped. The statistical and the system biology kind of work was done by Aldo and David. You also saw them. So collaborators on, on the second study. And this is our founders. And thank you for your intention. You look very tired already. <laughs> It's in the second on the second stage or the uh, on the second part. <laughs> uh, did your control include uh, different races? Like uh, I, I would assume that uh, different races, like in, in a culture, in a culture, I don't know, like in the Asian culture.
culture, like usually <coughs> they have different uh, way of behaving uh, than, I don't know, than Africa. So uh, maybe some of the genes are actually kind of encode behavior and, and like uh, you can see okay. uh, some can be more correlated to what you call a pivot. Okay, so so the answer is that for the de novo mutations, uh, most of them are Euro uh, with European ancestry. Some of them are not. We are not so worried about that when we look at de novo mutations. However, if you look at uh, inherited mutations or common variation, you must adjust the cases and controls very, very tightly or very strictly that they will be from the same ancestry, otherwise, otherwise you get really uh, uh, false results. And, and as I said, most of the studies are, are on European uh, um, ancestry. There are also on Chinese individuals, like genome-wide association studies done on Chinese. Uh, um, I just reviewed this kind of paper um, today. Um, but most of the studies are, are done on Europeans. And, and of course, there are cultural uh, differences, but, uh, no, but there is actually an expert here. I mean, if you have a Chinese ch child with autism, you will probably diagnose him in a, maybe in a similar way, no? No, it's four, four to seven on the, on the, on the severe, yeah. Severe cases. High functioning. So in general, I want to say, uh, so this is a good question. I want to say something about this, about the gender. Okay, first of all, uh, it, it depends on if you look at high functioning or, or severe cases. High functioning, there is, it's actually more like 10 times or 8 times more boys than girls. Now, in general, we see that girls are just, um, I would call it less sensitive to mutations or, or disruption of, of the brain. In the way we see it from the genetics perspective, um, we, I've, I've been talking about de novo copy number variations, those deletions and duplications. So when you see those kind of deletions and duplications in girls, on average they are larger, for example. Also all those de novo single nucleotide variations that disrupt the protein are more common in, in girls with autism than in boys. So all the genetics, so uh, in another world, we can say that for, for girls to become autistic, they need like a, a bigger disruption of, of, of the gene or the system. But we should also ne need to take into account that there may, might be biases in the diagnosis. Right. Only the X chromosome. The X chromosome could not... The X effect is precisely the square. Yeah. 6% is, is quoted. But, but the X chromosome could not explain the, 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 the differences between males and females here. There are more than that, just that.
so the question is whether we're looking at epigenetics or methylation in brains. We are doing something similar on looking at um, allelic expression across different uh, brain regions in autistic uh, cases and, and controls, which reveals uh, epigenetic modifications or, or AR. Uh, and we do see abnormal epigenetics as well as genetic insults. Uh, but I didn't talk about it. I couldn't talk about everything. Um, could you comment? So first of all, as far as I know, this is going to be one, the differences between you know, classical autism and PDD. So PDD is a perversive developmental disorder. This is gone already in the, the new DSM-5. The other thing that I can tell you is that the diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder is quite stable, right? meaning that if you take a child from different centers, if if he will get the diagnosis in one as autism spectrum disorder, he will, uh, in most cases, also get the same kind of uh, diagnosis in another center. But exactly what it is, this is more kind of depends on the center. From the genetics point of view, we don't see currently, we, cannot, we don't know enough to kind of take the, the, the genotype and predict the phenotype in a way that I could, I could say that there are differences between PDD and uh, uh, classical autism. I could say that some of the mutations are also associated in addition to autism with mental retardation or with brain growth, okay? So some type of mutations almost always go with uh, some kind of in, uh, uh, intellectual disabilities. This is something that you could predict, but not exactly whether it's autism or PDD or Asperger, or and they could be also in the same family with the same mutation. So, if you began <coughs> to by telling us that within families, this condition is really very highly heritable uh, from the, the, the twin studies. Uh, but the picture that I got, at least, is that across the entire spectrum, there are no individual genes which really cause it. It sounds like there's a lot of genes. Are you still hoping that some big signal will arise if you look in the right place? Um, and if not, uh, if you have to accept, or if we all have to accept ultimately that we're talking about a lot of small effects of, of a large number of genes, uh, what can the genetics really help us in understanding either the mechanism or, or coming up with some sort of treatment? Okay. So uh, just I try to summarize your question. <laughs> Okay, which will be hard. <laughs> so if, if I understand, you, uh, you say if there is a lot of genes with small effect, what can the genetics provide us? No, one or, question, or one of them. Still hoping there will be one big signal, okay. and then so, the so when you say large or small effect, it depends what you're looking at. Are you looking at the population, or you, first? So this is one answer. Or are you looking at the particular individual? Okay, in a particular individual, it could be a very large effect because he has a disruption of a specific gene which causes autism. This could be one case, okay? On the population level, th there will be a small effect because this mutation is very rare, okay? All the, all the studies you showed us now, are populations. What? All the studies you showed us today are populations. Yeah, but in some cases, though, there are those big, large deletions, for example. These are almost causat causative, okay? So in this particular individual, this will cause autism, okay? At the level of the population, it will be, you would call it low effect, okay? So this is one thing. What I've, I was just, sh I think, showing here is that there is a convergence, okay? First of all, we knew from many studies one convergence was towards synaptic genes, okay? The other thing... With, with the biases. With the biases, of course. But they're still there. Okay, even in our analysis, we do see them. Okay, not as strong as chromatin regulators. Again, the chromatin regulators, this is a, a very general thing. Yeah, so there is a convergence here on transcription factors, but this is like saying, I don't know what, it's a very um, general thing, and we still don't know what those chromatin regulators are doing. 
One, one option is that they have a very important part in the development of the brain. Maybe they're also very important in, in the adult uh, brain. We don't really know. Okay? We do see that many of those genes we know already interact physically with each other, the proteins. So we do hope that from this huge list of genes, we would be able to have uh, not uh, 1,000 cases, but maybe we could divide them into, I don't know, 10 or 20 groups. Maybe I'm naive. I don't know. We will need to wait. Before zero, it was in weeks. After zero, it was in years. Years? Yes. Because I, I wonder how you would connect gene expression to the behavior effects of delayed development. So, so in this case, we just use the gene expression to divide the genes to genes that are mainly active before birth and genes that are mainly active after birth. This is what we do. You could use this gene expression to do um, a more, uh, uh, to dissect a more smaller groups, but this is what we did. Okay. What do you mean? Maybe I didn't explain the graph, but um, I didn't. But the red ones are expressed, yeah, in the adult brain after after zero. After zero, after birth, they are active, and they are active all the time in different regions of the brain. What do you mean overlap? For example, those that are, the red is like 18. Those are only genes that are expressed at 18. No, they are active all the time, from here to here. You see a, dr a big drop before zero. Okay, It goes up after birth. You don't have uh, data here, but you see that they are active here. They have low expression here. Okay. So they go up. And after birth, they are very stable. After birth, they are very stable. The blue ones are very active during development, and then they go down. After, exactly after birth, they go down, and they have a stable expression of, of low expression. Sorry for not explaining this. It's not two types of genes. Each one represents two groups of genes. Okay? 